In 1959, shortly after retiring as Taoiseach, Eamon de Valera was elected President of Ireland. Sean Lamas succeeded him as Taoiseach. It is as our head and rightful chief that I now address you, to whom, above all other men, we owe our freedom to choose for ourselves the president of a sovereign, independent, democratic Irish state. By 1959, Sean Lamas is clearly the Fianna Fáil person in waiting. He's derived a fair bit of experience. Um, the country, well, you know, he'd been around for a while. Uh, some seismic events had taken place yeah. when Fianna Fáil were out of office. And he's able to take power because de Valera is elevated to the highest office of the land, that of presidency. And, and what, an, what an apt and avid Taoiseach he became. De Valera and Lamas uh, played two complementary roles, I think, in the development of their party in, in Irish politics. The major part that Dev played uh, initially was managing the split in the Sinn Féin organization. But uh, the business of actually building up the party was primarily Lamas's contribution. And it, it suited them both, in a sense, uh, for uh, De Valera to be the somewhat ethereal, visionary, slightly remote figure that people uh, could give their adulation to, could follow as a kind of prophet, as a kind of messiah. And the mass, the nuts and bolts man, who was organizing the party with Boland and other people on the ground. It was like um, a two-person act, if you like, and each of them was as essential as the other. Le Mas was much more impatient, so there's a whole change of style when Le Mas becomes Taoiseach. Cabinet meetings do not go on interminably. Decisions are reached, votes are called. Le Mas wanted decisions. Uh, somebody, I better not say who, told me that at a meeting of the, the Fianna Fáil National Executive, um, between Dev's retirement as chair and Le Mas's coming in, that they got one of the standard letters from some, you know, Paddy Murphy down the country, a long-time supporter, uh, who had a pothole not filled in, even though he'd assured everybody around that, of course, his his links with Dublin, with headquarters, with intruders filled in. And Paddy Murphy had sent in his resignation in a fit of dudgeon. Is this the way the party treats a loyal servant for 40 years? And that he would come in and Dev would say, Paddy Murphy, we all know Paddy Murphy. The stout of the stout, the brave is the brave, the loyalist of the loyal. I stayed in his house on some date in 1922. And so we can't have Paddy. Fianna Fáil isn't Fianna Fáil without Paddy Murphy. And so Tommy Mullins or Joe Groomer, one of the stores, would go down and fill in that bloody pothole. He wouldn't say bloody, of course. Fill in that pothole and make sure everybody sees it's being filled in and that it's filled in because Paddy wanted it filled in, right? Unfortunately, some Paddy Murphy got his resignation at the wrong time after Lamas, after Dev going and Lamas coming in. And so Lamas looks at it, the boys sit back to hear the, you know, the, the, the tribute to Paddy Murphy's loyalty to the party, etc. And Lamas says, Paddy Murphy? Well, we all know Paddy Murphy. He's a grown man. He must be assumed to know his own mind. Resignation? Accepted. There was a boom going on. Uh, the, the, the greatest boom the human race has ever seen was the boom between 1943 and 1973. The French economy took off, the Germans came back from nowhere in the most extraordinary uh, Wirtschaft wonder of the 1950s. And the Japanese, who had been nuked in 1945, uh, became uh, a great world power. And the Irish were going nowhere. And there were letters to the paper and there were articles in the newspapers in the 1950s saying, how is it that the Germans whom we were sending charity to a few years ago, are now richer than we are and are going to get much richer in the next 10 years. What is wrong with us? Uh, yeah, there was this kind of sense of disappointment and failure. We were in a state of severe stagnation after the war. Emigration was very high, unemployment was very high. And the question was in many minds whether Ireland could survive as an independent entity. Perhaps. We weren't able for the independence we had achieved in 1922. In 1956, the census reveals that the population of the Republic of Ireland is at its lowest level since the, the setting up of the state. On the 40th anniversary of the Easter Rising, the Irish Times asks, if this continues unchecked, Ireland will fail. And not in the remote future, but soon. So something must be done. 
Le Mans sees that and the civil servants see that. The question then is, what's to be done? When um, Fianna Fáil came back into power, uh, I think a process was already underway within the Department of Finance in terms of the preparation of a document in regard to economic development. Uh, Ken Whitaker was, was secretary at the time, and I think he was very concerned that the economy really was getting into more and more serious trouble, and that we really needed to kind of plan our way, at least to some degree, out of that. I decided that we had had tremendous opportunity, which most of our contemporaries didn't have, of advancing in both education and in jobs, and that we owed it to the country to apply whatever we had acquired uh, to the country's advantage. So with the help of these colleagues, I got to work on what turned out to be economic development. So he produced this, this particular book, which is called Economic Development, which is probably often the most referred to book in Ireland, but many people would never have actually seen it. And it's a very detailed look, particularly the agricultural sector. But what's special about it is it brought together all the sectors in the economy at the same time. And that had never been done previously. Whitaker's report strikes a balance between agriculture and industry as sources of sustained growth. Le Mas is a Dubliner, after all. Uh, he is not... Um, an instinct instinctive sympathizer with the rural way of life. Uh, he puts rather more emphasis on the industrial drive. But the main point he agrees totally with is to, to, in a sense, to reverse the sense of psychological malaise. The sense that, you know, we've made a mess of it, we can't do it, we can't handle it. The only, the only solution is to get out. I might have been crying in the wind if there hadn't been a man like Lamas on the political side of things with his drive and efficiency. When you get first-class minds like Whitaker uh, and others in the civil service too, uh, and when you get a driver like Lamas, when you find them on the same wavelength, then um, the lead from the top injects a sense of purpose and direction into a big number of people who have previously said, I'd love to go this way, but there's no point doing it because I'd be blocked, I'd be stopped, right? So in that sense, Le Mas conveys a sense, you know, we can go for it, and we're not going to fall on our faces necessarily. So he injects self-confidence. We were fortunate that at that time in the world outside, things were brightening up too. Um, the Kennedy era had begun in America, and with that, a great psychological uplift. And um, we benefited from that, and we were able to turn things around so that for a while we were making considerable progress year by year economically. Although by modern standards uh, it wasn't that spectacular, by Irish standards it was a miracle at that time. They had growth rates of three or four percent, and the economy more or less doubled in size. But I think more importantly than that, they proved that it could work. They proved that the economy could develop. They proved that Irish people could make things and sell things that other people wanted to buy. And also, we could produce managers. We could produce people who uh, could run factories, who could run airlines, who could run big companies of various kinds, uh, of a, in a way and on a scale that Ireland had never really managed to do previously. The picture of the Ireland and the Irish people which was presented to the outside world in the past was often a false and distorted one. We want to substitute for it a more true representation, that of a vigorous, progressive, modern nation, proud of its history and traditions, but looking confidently to the future and determined that in the future it will take second place to none in any field of progress. Sean Lamas understood business. His Irish landscape was an industrial landscape. It wasn't the rural Ireland of De Valera's idyll. So Le Mas, he loves opening factories, the new RTE station, 
ESB stations, electricity generators. He doesn't want donkeys and turf stacks. That's not the Ireland he's trying to create. But one of the things that makes people uncomfortable is that this seems to open the door for a materialistic element in Fianna Foyle. That money and the economy become the main thing. And this allows this younger generation who is associated with the mohair suits and that kind of the business element within Fianna Foyle actually is given a lead by Sean Lamass. When you love someone, it's the little things that go. One of Sean Lamass's objectives as Taoiseach was Ireland's entry into the EEC. In July 1961, the application for membership was made. Mr Lamass, what do you think was the climate of opinion at Brussels? Are you happy now that we have a good chance of getting into the EEC, the common market, on good terms, on terms we want? The uh, meeting yesterday, of course, was only uh, of a preliminary character. I think I can say that the uh, whole atmosphere was, was very friendly. We have, of course, a long process of negotiation before us, and one could not predict now what may emerge during the course of these negotiations. But I think that there is every reason to expect a favourable outcome. If Lamas has a major objective in coming into power in, in 59-60, it is actually to achieve full membership of the European Economic Community. Um, Northern Ireland, of course, is another major objective in, in, in industrialisation, but the, the key to prosperity in Ireland and the key to getting out of the doldrums of the 50s is to get into the European Economic Community and modernise agriculture. And that's why so much effort is put into that first uh, application in 61-63. It doesn't succeed. Um, largely because of de, uh, de Gaulle's dislike or mistrust of the British at that particular point. But the, the linking thing is, is cooperation, that Lamas wants cooperation exactly. with, with Britain, he wants it with Northern Ireland, and he sees Ireland cooperating internationally. In January 1965, Sean Lamas travelled to Belfast to meet the Prime Minister of Northern Ireland, Terence O'Neill. I suspect that the North uh, was always part of his priorities, but that it came after the economy for the very simple reason that there was no point in making any overtures to the North if you didn't have something to offer them, and if all you had to offer them was a slightly backward, rather underdeveloped country, that the economy was a bit shaky, you know, you'd be wasting your breath going and talking to people there. So when he felt that he had done enough, or at least got wheels under the Irish economy uh, in the early 1960s, then he was much more open to something from the North. Once O'Neill issued the invitation, it was up to Lamas to say yes or no. And Lamas picked the ball up and ran with it very dramatically and very successfully. Of course, I went with him on a famous occasion at the invitation of Terence O'Neill to Stormont. The car came to the door here, and uh, I went out, and um, Lamas was there, and I got in, and he took the pipe out of his mouth. Henry, Belfast. What is it? And poor Henry, the guard, the driver, had no idea that he was going to go to Belfast, and he hadn't enough petrol to get beyond Dundalk. And that was the first hitch in the secrecy arrangements, because once we appeared in Dundalk, you see, various people began to wonder, what are they up to? What's the T-shirt and this other fellow doing? Going to going off in a state car across the border. Before 1965, Terence O'Neill had said that it would be impossible for Lamas to meet him because the Taoiseach didn't recognise O'Neill's existence because he didn't recognise the existence of Northern Ireland. By going to Belfast and meeting O'Neill, Lamas effectively recognises the existence of Northern Ireland, if not its legitimacy. The discussion then wasn't on any high political plane at all. It was on how, by better cross-border arrangements, we could improve things. And there was a search made for 
various projects like development of canals that connected with the urn and all sorts of bits and pieces of that kind. But the whole thing it was kept away from any serious hint of an integration policy. The spin that was put on the meeting was that we, we didn't discuss politics. But of course the meeting, the politics were in the meeting itself, not on what they discussed. And that broke the ice. It, it, it made a huge change, uh, I think. Now, it was popular during the Troubles to denigrate the Lamas and Neil meetings as, as leading to nothing, that there were this brief period of naive optimism and hopelessness. But if you look at the Good Friday Agreement and in the North-South bodies, you'll see the same uh, areas and the same issues brought up and developed in a slightly different package. But the, the, the Lamas and Neil agenda goes through Sunningdale in the 1970s and on into the Good Friday Agreement. So Lamas begins something in North-South relations that is still with us and will continue to develop, I think, in developing relations within the island. I'd say Le Mans wouldn't stand for any nonsense. And um, I think most of his colleagues would be afraid to get into an argy-bargy with him because they knew he would get, <laughs> get the better of them. Le Mans was very, very uh, impatient in many ways. For example, uh, when he made his appointments, particularly the appointment of Brian Walsh to the Supreme Court, uh, he explicitly said to Brian Walsh, look, I want you to be more like the American Supreme Court. In other words, don't just interpret the law, make the law, push change. The last thing that Lamas does is to start the modernization of the educational system. The educational system, you must remember, was moribund in the 1950s. 50% 50 of the kids left school at 13. It's a different country. And what Lamas and company did in the 1960s, they started to dismantle this whole apparatus uh, that had grown up under British and Irish rule uh, in the previous century, with the comprehensive schools, with free education, with uh, investment in higher education, and encouragement of mass education. In a general election in April 1965, Sean Lamas returned as Taoiseach. He did not stay for the full term. My decision to relinquish office was a political decision uninfluenced by any personal consideration whatever. There's certainly no question about my general health, which I'm glad to say is quite good. Uh, the I'm convinced that it's in the interest of the, the country and of the government and of the Fianna Fáil party that there's a responsibility should now pass to a, a younger man. He says the reasons are political. There's a certain mystery about this. I think myself that he was conscious about the fact of his declining health. He was smoking a, a, at least a pound of strong pipe tobacco every week. And Charlie Hoy afterwards said that it was the, it was the pipe that, that killed him. Now, whether he was that conscious that his physical powers were, were beginning to fade, he always denied this. He said that he didn't want to stay on beyond his time. He wanted to make way for a younger man. Uh, but it's not quite clear why he went just when he did. He was surrounded by people who were younger than him and hungry, uh, including his own son-in-law, Charlie, uh, Charlie Hahi, um, George Colley, and... Um, then there was Jack Lynch. And I think he had a kind of detached look at them. Uh, he approached Lynch, he favoured Lynch rather than either Collie or Hahi. I think he saw Hahi as a bit unstable uh, and too young. And he saw Collie as too traditionalist and old fashioned. But he did remark at one stage about Collie and Lynch. One of them 
has to go home to ask his wife for permission to run for Taoiseach. And the other has to go home to ask his wife for permission not to run for Taoiseach. That's Lamas's comment about both of them. And I think he just shrugged his shoulders and just walked away, <laughs> frankly. <laughs> He did take his chances and run with them, uh, you know, and he did three, he had three uh, policy areas. First, the economy. Second, the Northern Ireland. Third, education. And in all three, he made a huge impact. And I think that's enough. I, I think he probably did more in a shorter time than any Taoiseach that I can think of. Following the resignation of Sean Lamas, Jack Lynch succeeded him as Taoiseach. The thing that makes Lynch different from all other Taoiseach is that Lynch had a huge national reputation before he ever went into politics at all, and that was as a hurler. His record in terms of All-Ireland medals in hurling for Cork. Uh, he had a football medal as well as hurling medals. He was a national figure. And he was accustomed to that kind of limelight, the sportsman's limelight, from a very, very early age. But Lynch did not have a Fianna Fáil past, so he's no roots, he's no history, and therefore, in the eyes of people like Blaney and Haw, he's, he's not entitled to be a Fianna Fáil T-shirt. Jack Lynch clearly doesn't have a driving ambition to be Taoiseach. And this is, becomes problematic for him later on because he is seen as a, an individual who doesn't have a vision that he's desperate to implement, that he's a person with a sense of obligation and responsibility and steps in to the role rather than someone who sought it. Well, uh, Jack Lynch, when he was elected in 1966, uh, was regarded by some as a sort of temporary stopgap. In other words, somebody that um, those who were uh, behind the scenes thought they could put in for a few years, he'd be nice and amenable, and then they'd get rid of him and put in somebody more significant. And that's where they made a mistake. Uh, he turned out to be uh, much tougher than had been anticipated. Lynch continued the Lamas line on Northern Ireland. He visits Northern Ireland and O'Neill visits and makes a return visit. There is a sort of a, a continuation of the Lamas sort of stratagem on Northern Ireland. When we went to Stormont, I went with him two years after the visit with Lamas. And this time, it's also winter, there was snow on the ground. And there were two black figures standing in the snow, armed with snowballs. One was the Reverend Ian Pacey. And they threw snowballs at the car, and the car missed. But when we were getting out at Terence O'Neill's residence, we could hear Paisley bellowing in the crisp, frosty air. No Pope here! No Pope here! And Jack turned to me and said, which of us does he think is the Pope? In a soft cork accent. <laughs> it was in 68 that you had the first inklings of unrest, as, as it was uh, called. Um, and uh, the unrest became more serious, but it became more serious because the um, RUC and the B-Specials under the direction of Stormont, um, you know, became quite violent. 
in trying to repress peaceful marches. On the 12th of August 1969, the Royal Ulster Constabulary dispersed nationalists who were protesting against an apprentice boys parade which passed close to the nationalist bogside area of Derry. The ensuing riots became known as the Battle of the Bogside. You've got to remember that at that stage, there were no civil servants in the Taoiseach's department and no civil servants in the Department of External Affairs working on Northern Ireland, not one. And the response is therefore very, very low key. You have a position where the lynch is so bereft and devoid of advice that during the Battle of the Bogside, Ken Whitaker, to whom he'd become close, was on holiday in Connemara. And one of the guards came and tapped on his door and said he had to ring the Taoiseach's department as soon as possible. So he went to the guard station, he rang the Taoiseach's department, Lynch wanted to talk to him about what he should do about Northern Ireland. Now, that doesn't seem to me to be the way in 1969 to run a Northern Ireland policy. So from the Garda Barracks in Corna, for the first and only time in its history, I think, uh, they had a direct line of communication with the teacher. And um, I, he told me what was going on and what pressures he was under, and I advised strongly to resist those pressures, to send nothing more threatening than ambulances, and um, to slap down on anyone who wanted to intervene militarily. Lynch and his colleagues are found wanting, uh, so much so that um, he and members of his cabinet are on holidays in August 1969, which is not something you'd obviously do if there was going to be a crisis. If you thought there might be a crisis breaking out, you wouldn't send your minister, or you wouldn't allow your minister for external affairs to go on holidays to, to Ackle on a painting trip. Michael, I would say that in hindsight, and we have the benefit of this remove, it is absolutely shocking that the Irish government was so ill-prepared, even with contingencies regardless of their uh, essential dialogue with London on these matters. Mm. They have a constitutional imperative to be looking at the affairs of that part of the mm. country. In practical terms, the uh, Irish government in 69 is in a very parlous position uh, in relation to the breakdown of law and order, the sort of the, the, the uh, uh, RUC becoming a sort of feral organisation and or fe going feral in, 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 in Derry. Um, they, 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 they panic, the they panic in, in August 69, yeah. after the 13th of August, and rush in a whole range of emergency measures, mm. uh, largely because they don't see the British government doing anything sort of to, in a sense, counteract what is happening in Northern Ireland. Mm. And these are the people with the, res the Dublin field has, has the responsibility to do something about it, and they've done nothing, yeah. irrespective of the successive and continuous uh, lobbying of Dublin, saying the, the balloon is about to go up. Mm. Good evening. It is with deep sadness that you and I Irish men and women of goodwill have learned of the tragic events which have been taking place in Derry and elsewhere in the north in recent days. The entire southern establishment and the Fianna Fáil government are absolutely wrong-footed by, by the explosion in August 1969. They simply do not see it coming and they're at sea in the early stages of that crisis. And in that um, situation, Lynch makes his famous um, speech on the 13th of August as the Battle of the Bogside is raging. It is evident also that the Stormont government is no longer in control of the situation. Indeed, the present situation is the inevitable outcome of the policies pursued for decades by successive Stormont governments. It is clear also that the Irish government can no longer stand by and see innocent people injured and perhaps worse.
Now, Lynch's speech has two effects. One, thousands of nationalists in Northern Ireland genuinely believe that the Irish army are coming to rescue them. That's what people in Derry believe. In Belfast, rumours spread that the Irish army have crossed the border and taken Newry. They see Lynch's speech as evidence that the Free State, as they would have called it, is coming to their rescue. On the other hand, thousands of Unionists genuinely take Lynch's speech to believe that the Irish Army are also invading Northern Ireland. They also believe the Irish Army has crossed the border, and it certainly leads to an intensification of the violence in Belfast, because Unionists believe that the Irish Army is coming to get them, and Catholics believe that the Irish Army is coming to rescue them. So in many ways, Lynch's speech has a disastrous effect uh, within Northern Ireland itself. And it's evidence, again, of a split cabinet. But that speech was a compromise that was hammered out by Lynch, who was trying to hold the disparate elements of his cabinet together, because Blaney and Boland in particular were applying very, very strong pressure for a Republican uh, approach to Northern Ireland. They wanted the FCA called up to full-time service, and Lynch and the great majority of the cabinet said no, certainly not. What's called the first line reserve had been called up, but uh, that, that was consisted of about 2,000 um, officers and men um, who had retired relatively recently. But they were fully trained uh, people uh, who had spent a good many years in the army. The FCA was a different situation. They were raw youths uh, who had little or no training. We have therefore directed the Irish army authorities to have field hospitals established in County Donegal adjacent to Derry and at other points along the border where they may be necessary. Word came through that Jack Lynch uh, was going to open the camps. And if you're standing in Derry, you think, oh, the camp, the nearest camp was in Letterkenny, 20 miles away. How do you get there? There was one car on my street. We didn't have the price of a taxi. Such buses as appeared in the bog side were burned in a scorched earth policy. Hey, what? If we're going to be evacuated, where's the trans transport? It is our intention to request the British government to enter into early negotiations with the Irish government to review the present constitutional position of the six counties of Northern Ireland. You also have to put in another aspect to this, which is nothing to do with Jack Lynch or an Irish government but to do with the position of the Unionist cabinet in Belfast. They had been told that if they asked for the British army to come in, that was it, that was curtains, there would be direct rule. So what you have is a government which knows that a small police force it has cannot cope with the scale of public disorder which is now looming. When it does get terribly out of control and there's massive suffering which bears worst on the minority of the Catholics in Belfast, on the one hand, the British then send in their troops, but too late to stop it. And on the other hand, Stormont isn't abolished. And the British troops are still there up until 1972, effectively in the eyes of Republicans as the armed wing of Stormont. But Stormont is weak. So you can have a military campaign with a view to destabilizing the situation to bring about the collapse of Stormont. So the British get the worst of both worlds. They neither save Catholic West Belfast in time, nor do they then, once they do come in, get rid of Stormont and get themselves a clean sheet by which to then try and change the situation. They create the context in which the emergence of a visual IRA is almost inevitable. Irish citizens too, who want what's best for their country, regardless of what political party or none that they are in. I know, well, you can, you can poo-poo all that if oh, you like. Oh, That's a fact, right? Yeah, that's, that's more of the old stuff. Well, this is, well, yeah, this is really true. Everyone well, wants well, the best for the country. Well, and all listen, if you want to move yeah, yeah, from yeah. Dublin North, come over to Dublin South West, <laughs> and I'll look after your interests. <laughs> How to do your head in it? Tonight with Vincent Brown, Monday to Thursday at 5 past 11 on 3. It's a new year, and that means it's time to meet some new friends.
Yes, Animal A&D is back tackling tough new cases. I think surgery is the option for us. As well as taking care of more adorable pets. Not only is he blind, but he's got no eyes at all. Don't miss the new series of Ireland's Animal A&D. Thursday at 7.30 on 3. Covered pets are happy pets with petinsurance.ie. Proud sponsors of Animal A&E. Lynch's problem is he's the first Taoiseach to be confronted with subversion from within his own cabinet. And that was the most serious threat to Irish parliamentary democracy, to the Irish democratic state since the army mutiny in the aftermath of the civil war in 1923 24. In 1970, Jack Lynch was faced with what became known as the arms trial. Five men, including two government ministers, Charles Hawhey and Neil Blaney, were charged with conspiracy to illegally import arms into the state. Lynch, like everyone else, was very annoyed at what was going on in the North um, and the way that, uh, in particular, Catholics and nationalists were treated. That was, of course, a, a cause of uh, great annoyance. Uh, but uh, he wasn't going to allow that to be used to pursue policies uh, that could have inflamed the entire country, the entire island, uh, and made things uh, very much worse. And in particular, he wasn't going to allow it uh, to happen in defiance of government policy. When their resignation is demanded, and when they don't resign, and they're sacked, and then another minister, Boland, resigns in support of Hohe and Blaney. And then there's the question of the, the trials that ensued. Boland wasn't involved, so there's no question of his coming to trial. The evidence is regarded as insufficient to proceed with the prosecution of Blaney. And then finally, ultimately, Hohe is acquitted. And they have vindicated all those who have been smeared and blackguarded by the powers that be, who ran, who ran this trial not merely as a prosecution, but as the counsel said inside, as a persecution. But I think they've got their answer today, and I hope they realize it and, and take the appropriate action and after. What, what action is that? That is to make way for those who believe in a Republican Party running this country yes. and not the sort that we're developing at the moment. <laughs> You want Jack Lynch to resign? I couldn't care less what he does. Honest Jack becomes a kind of term of abuse as far as the Hawhees are concerned. This gentle Egypt almost. Uh, and, that, you know, he's not in the real world. He had that opposition which was working away um, against him as a leader uh, and against the policies he was pursuing. And they were key people because you had Charlie Hawhey and you had Niall Blaney, and you had Kevin Boland, um, each of whom had their own support base as well within the party. So trying to manage that was very, very difficult. Um, and it's not just that they were ordinary members, but they were ministers. People have said, uh, who are members of my party now, uh, who have been members of my party, that they were proposed to challenge my leadership. Leadership has been challenged in almost every country. I propose to meet these challenges. I still believe that I have the best, uh, the support of the vast majority of the members of our parliamentary party and the members of our organisation throughout the country. There's two bits of this that are quite extraordinary. One, you had the trial and Lynch sort of being seen to be in a leadership position of having at least temporarily won out within Fianna Foil. And then you had the not guilty verdicts. And the not guilty verdicts could have produced a cataclysm within Fianna Foil. They had the potential yes. to, to drive him out. Um, and yet, he had the strength to hang in there and if you want to look at politics as a, as a blood sport which on occasions unfortunately too many people perceive it to be he ba basically vanquished those who uh, had sought to oppose him at that stage and to adopt a policy he wasn't party to
Bloody Sunday seems coming a few months after internment to be the the ultimate example of of Britain's historical role in Ireland. Again, even the very name Bloody Sunday reminds people of what happened in 1920. Unarmed civil rights demonstrators are being shot down on the streets of Derry. The British are lying about it. Uh, they're claiming that, that, that these were armed men. Everybody knows it's not true. And there is an intense wave then of, of, of nationalist feeling, both north and south. <laughs> There was a level of emotion in the country at Intense the time, emotion. which, if you didn't have a rational response, could have produced absolute mayhem. And, uh, I mean, you're right, there was a rational analysis and a presentation to the country to try and bring about calm at that time. The day of Bloody Sunday, you're thinking, Britain is killing us. This is Britain to whom we had we had this bright idea in 1968. We'll look for civil rights from Britain once you know how bad the unionists are. We'll be grand, there'll be fair play. Four years later, they're shooting you dead as you lie on the ground. What a shock. The bottom line that night was, if it does not suit Britain, they will kill you. Because we're not fully fed subjects, don't forget, that's the United Kingdom of Great Britain and Northern Ireland, we're the hind tipped. And we knew that night. Following Bloody Sunday, there's a huge uh, upheaval in the South. I mean, the very foundations of the state begin to shake, because here is a massacre of Irish people by the British Army, and all the main political parties in the South are supposed to stand for a united Ireland. It's a question asked, what are you going to do about this? And there's strikes and demonstrations and walkouts and the government are forced to declare a national day of mourning on the day of the Bloody Sunday victims' funerals. There are several days of demonstrations in Dublin which culminate in the burning of the embassy uh, in Merrion Square. I was outside the British Embassy in Merrion Square when it was, when the march got there and when it was stoned and, and, and firebombed effectively and the very point you're making Alan was the Gardaí whoever was in charge was brilliant because they allowed this mob to dissipate its anger in a way that actually calmed the thing um, and there was all sorts of people it wasn't just kind of the usual suspects the 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 Derry massacre the bloody Sunday provoked such a sense of outrage uh, that the the anger was it was in Cohate, it was, it was everything. You had to bring calm to the situation in the first instance. You had to show nationalist Ireland uh, that you were serious about this issue, um, that you resented the fact uh, that Derry was being treated, the people, the nationalists of Derry were being treated in this way. He had to placate his own members, all of whom had the same aim, the same hopes, the same aspirations, nationalist, republican for Northern Ireland, but who wanted to act in different ways. Mr. Faulkner and I are opposed as regards the ultimate ideals. Mr. Faulkner maintains his desire and those whom he represents to remain linked with the United Kingdom. My desire remains that we should have a united Ireland. Therefore, these are ideals very far apart. It's important that people, even though they can't reconcile their ideals and their views, should continue to talk about them. And as long as we can talk, then there's some hope for, as the uh, communique indicates, for uh, political reconciliation. One of the most significant achievements of Lynch's first term as Taoiseach was Ireland's entry into the European Economic Community in 1973. Ireland is the youngest of the states represented here. However, we are one of the oldest nations of Europe. At our signing here today of the Acts of Accession, which marks a decisive step towards the future cooperation of our 10 countries, it is surely appropriate that we should draw hope and inspiration from the achievements of the past 20 years and the vision which made them possible. However, despite overseeing Ireland's entry into the EEC, 
In February of that year, Jack Lynch and Fianna Fáil were defeated in a general election and replaced by a Fine Gael Labour coalition led by Liam Cosgrave as Taoiseach. Almost 51 years after his father, W.T. Cosgrave, first held the same position. Is Liam Cosgrave his own man, uh, or is he his father's, you know, um, uh, replica in certain ways? Is he modelling himself on his father? Uh, I think both, as a matter of fact. I think he is his own man. He knows that the 1970s are not the 1920s, but he knows there are many parallels between them. Um, he must admire his father greatly. He has a lot to admire. Uh, and uh, his father, after all, was successful in what he regarded as his fundamental objective, which was to establish a stable state. You know, the safety of the state is the supreme law in a crisis situation. And I think in that he would certainly have been heartened by the feeling that he was continuing a, uh, a noble family tradition that rendered fundamental service to the state. And just a quick reminder, Crime and Mind continues tomorrow night at 9 with the unsolved story of murdered teenager Raynard Murray. Don't miss that at 9. And for a full listing of tomorrow night's viewing, you can go to our website, tv3.ie.